396. And then that didn't do what I thought it should do. So I did 40 and 396 and moved the contact to the right hand. So inflammation in the nerve. Y'all are all FSM practitioners, so I'm not translating the numbers unless I get to something weird. Um, next to right hand was inflammation in the nerve, disc annulus, and the spinal cord, right? Should have worked. Should've worked. But the thing is, it didn't work. It didn't do anything. So uh, we're having technical issues, sort of. So there was no change in pain or tenderness when I treated the nerve. And that made me think. It's like, have you ever found a time when 40 and 396 did not decrease nerve pain? Right. No. It always works. So if 40 and 396 didn't work after 20 minutes, you know it's not nerve pain, right? That's diagnostic. <clears throat> so then I asked the mom, when did the pain start? Right? She said, well, it started gradually about one year after the original injury. He had no additional trauma because if it's going to be a disc and a nerve causing thoracic outlet, you'd expect it to have been caused by something, right? It doesn't come from space. No activity is commonly associated with thoracic outlet. He's not using a computer a lot. He has a brain injury and can hardly read. <coughs> Um, is not playing the guitar, not working in the garden, not doing a lot out in front of him, uh, no activities to cause thoracic outlet. And it has been progressive. So this is an important clue. Hold that thought, and we're going to go on to the next one. So I move the contact from the axilla to the hand, and here's my thought, that denervation or thalamic pain uh, starts not immediately after the brain injury. Disc injuries and nerve injuries start immediately after the injury. So if this thing was, if his arm pain and hand pain was caused by disc and nerve, it was going to start immediately. Not so much. It started a year later. My thalamic pain patients there are some post-stroke patients where the thalamic pain starts immediately if the stroke is in the periventricular area. But in brain bleeds, where the brain is going to bleed, so I had this one hemorrhagic stroke patient where his thalamic pain did not start for five years after his hemorrhagic stroke. So this kid, he had brain bleeds, subdural and subarachnoid bleeds, <clears throat> in the left side of his skull, that would cause right-sided pain. And fortunately for me, I had been Catholi there to answer the anatomy. But before he answered the anatomy, I wanted to find out, is this central? 40 and 396 didn't work. So... If it's not peripheral, then when is it in somebody that has a head injury, it's central. So 40 and 92, the sensory cortex, and 40 and 89 began reducing the pain. That is, I could lay my hand on his arm and he stopped flinching and he stopped sweating. And in 20 minutes, he was asleep. The arm was non-painful. I could palpate it. I could massage it. I could do all sorts of things. Can you imagine doing Graston on somebody that has thalamic pain syndrome? I'll just leave that as an image with you. He was not tender to touch. So then I treated 94, trauma, 124, torn or broken, reboot, allergy reaction, vitality in the midbrain. <coughs> However, any time the frequency was changed from 40 and 89 to take the thalamic pain down, the patient roused and the pain returned. So I moved the towel from the ch to the chest at one point to eliminate the chest pain. The repair frequencies have to be used for about one to two minutes and then changed back to 40 and 89 to keep the pain down. So Paris Carbot was working with me. She's at the Functional Medicine Center at Cleveland Clinic, and she came over on Lynn Lease for, to the um, Pediatric Rehab Hospital. And um, she was running... Uh, I think, 40 with 94, 84, uh, medulla, cerebellum, forebrain, sensory cortex, 
had a lot of pain locally at the base. neuronal or thalamic damage leading to thalamic pain syndrome that was limited to the right upper extremity. It's possible that um, his pain over the next year would be normally um, what's the noise? Somebody cut their microphone off. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, so uh, where are we? Oh, so there's a chance that over the next couple of years, his thalamic pain as the thalamus uh, fibrosis and becomes non-functional, <laughs> the thalamic pain may uh, extend down the trunk to the hip, to the leg, but right now it's limited to the right or upper extremity. And there's a chance that um, treating the thalamus at this point might prevent that from happening. So here is the take home message for this patient. The pain relief was unlikely to be lasting. It's very uh, likely that he's gonna need a custom care just for 40 and 89 for home treatment and palliative care. His mom was there with him and um, she was open to that, um, whatever it takes to keep him out of pain. But what we learned from this was that um, it wasn't peripheral. So Dr. Catholi is going to order brain imaging to verify the thalamic scarring um, and changes to the tissue and the thalamus as a pain generator. So that's going to be the, um, the confirmation that this clinical effect is, um, is what's causing his pain. The, imaging, the brain imaging is going to be required to change the diagnosis from throat from thoracic outlet syndrome to thalamic pain syndrome because the frequency response is not sufficient for anybody but us. For us, we know that, well, if 40 and 396 and 40 and 710 doesn't fix it, it's not thoracic outlet. If 40 and 89 takes it away, it is thalamic pain. Why would anybody believe that? But the frequency response allows you not only to treat the patient, but to direct the follow-up imaging and evaluation of his situation. <clears throat> I haven't heard back from them yet about uh, how he has turned out, but it was really nice to have him leave the treatment session uh, pretty stoned, that was kind of fun, and completely pain-free. Yay, that made it a good day. Okay, then we did the seminar that weekend and um, we had a patient who had a small bowel obstruction after she had ovarian cancer, and um, that led to a small bowel obstruction requiring a liquid diet and three hospitalizations in the previous five years. She had full body pain since before the ovarian cancer that was worst since breast cancer. Um, so she had ovarian cancer and she had breast cancer, in two, ovarian cancer in 2008, um, and then breast cancer in 2012. That was the history we started with. Um, so she had chemo and surgery to remove the ovary after chemo. Um, and here was the thing. Finally, it occurred to me to ask her, if they're removing the ovaries, why would you have a small bowel obstruction? She did not have radiation therapy to the abdomen for the ovarian cancer, no radiation. <clears throat> and um, so I pursued it during the history, and it turns out that after they removed the ovary, um, they took her intestines out. Um, they did removal of the lymph nodes around the aorta. All of them were negative, but they took them out anyway but because you don't know that they're going to be negative until after you send them off for biopsy. So there was no spread to the lymph nodes at the aorta. 
Um, if you look at Netter, you'll see what the aorta and the, the posterior abdomen lymph nodes look like. They're, it's like Christmas lights. It, they're just everywhere. Um, they took her omentum uh, out of the small bowel and removed it. And then uh, she had breast cancer in 2012. She had a three centimeter tumor, chemo radiation and a lumpectomy, but that was all limited to the chest. Um, basically, the patient is, looks very healthy. She's normal weight, good skin tone, healthy looking, absolutely miraculous with you know all of this having happened in her history four years ago. When you palpate her abdomen, she was plus two to three tender. Um, uh, it was firm, and the right upper quadrant was the most tender. Um, no, sorry, right lower quadrant was the most tender. So that was interesting. So her small bowel obstruction was sort of midline, but her right lower quadrant was the most tender. Hold that in mind, because it's the key to this case is the surgery for the ovarian cancer, and some of that key involves knowing what's involved when you take the lymph nodes out around the aorta. How do you get to the lymph nodes around the aorta, right? How do you get there? You have to take the intestines out. Yeah? <clears throat> so we had one unit, so she had full body pain before the cancer. So we did one unit neck to feet at 40 and 10. We did the second unit from the back to the abdomen, just treating the scar tissue. 13 and 77 is for the scar tissue itself, 13 and 13, the lymphatics, and the small bowel, oh, sorry, 13 and 77, the adhesions in the abdomen itself, 13 in the small bowel, 22, and then 3 and 97. Um, and he's 20, 30 minutes into it. It was just not making much progress. At which point I asked the patient, how much water have you had to drink? And she said, oh, almost none today. Uh, she had a cup of coffee and maybe one glass of water in the morning, and this is now 7 o'clock at night. So um, it doesn't generally drink water, so she's generally dehydrated. Um, and the treatment wasn't working. It was just like really slow, like going through mud, right? So I gave her a glass of water. She drank 16 ounces. And then we treated scarring, 13 and 77 to the dissolved adhesions, 13 and 22 the small bowel, 13 and 62 the arteries, 3 and 97, remember they took out her omentum, at least part of it, 3 and 142, um, actually did a lot, um, scarring in the fascia. So there was another, t I was working on two patients at once, and there was another team working on this patient while I worked on another abdominal adhesion patient. Um, soften the general abdominal rigidity, and the treatment was much more productive. This was a reminder that the practitioner who recruited this patient to come was supposed to tell her to be hydrated, and that message didn't come through because the practitioner didn't know it was important. So the practitioner now knows, like won't ever forget, that hydration is really important. <clears throat> So the treatment was very productive. So the treatment plan for the practitioner that was going to be seeing this patient once she was, back, was in practice using FSM was to run the concussion protocol, repeat the frequencies for scarring, and then um, radiation-induced scar tissue in her chest. Radiation is the gift that keeps on giving. And um, the radiation for the breast cancer so 54 and 10 is frequencies to re remove radiation. 13 is scarring. And the problem with radiation is it cre creates ongoing inflammation in what tissues? 62, the blood supply. 142, the fascia. 77, the connective tissue. And the blood supply to the spinal cord and the nerves are the problem. The, pa the patients that I have seen with spinal cord sclerosis and neuropathic death, basically nerve death, because of scar tissue and the blood supply to the spinal cord and the nerves caused by radiation, uh, these made sort of a permanent impression on me. 17 is the lung, 59 and 39 is the spine, 238 is the bone marrow, 
what happens when you radiate bone marrow long term? Hmm, doesn't usually go well. Uh, <clears throat> so that is part of the treatment plan for her future. Continue to work on scarring in the connective tissue, the fascia, and the small bowel to prevent further obstructions. The patient is very nervous about um, any additional hospitalizations and liquid diet for the abdominal obstruction. Um, the concussion protocol, obviously. And at the end of the treatment, her abdomen was soft, non-tender, and the area of scarring in her small intestine, lower right quadrant, uh, was much improved. It was softer. It was not tender. It was we had a good. It was a good outcome. So here's the thing: Why would a patient get breast cancer and ovarian cancer? This is the this is the next part of this. Subsequent treatments, you want to treat the liver for toxicity, and you'd want to explore the physiology of estrogen detoxification and methylation. Why is this patient creating inflammatory estrogens, and why is she responding to those estrogens with uh, cancer? That's not normal. You can say maybe she has the genes for this or that, but genes are expressed in an environment. So how do we change the environment by either increasing her ability to methylate B12 and especially folic acid or uh, phosphorylate B6, right? So this is prevention of future estrogen-related cancers. Um, that's, that's for the future. Um, so we do the liver toxicity, right? So there we go. <clears throat> so that was that patient. She was on a table on the left side. The patient on the right side was a patient who had endometriosis since her teenage years. She had abdominal and pelvic pain. She was 38 years old. Diagnosis was endometriosis since the age of 18, so she was diagnosed at 18. She had surgery, abdominal surgery, laparoscopic surgery at the age of 22, and at the age of 28, she had a lap laparotomy to, uh, they just basically lice and um, coagulate the chocolate cysts and the endometriosis throughout the abdomen. Um, that, at the age of 28, allowed her to get pregnant, which was good. Um, she had three children um, between the age of 28. Uh, so in the previous 10 years, she'd had three kids. The oldest one is, I think, 10, 9 or 10. <coughs> um, incidentally, she said she's had a headache every day for 20 years. So that was just kind of thrown in as a add-on, right? When you looked at her posture, she was healthy and fit, but her trunk was flexed forward. She rated her resting pain as a four to a five out of 10. Um, her chief complaint actually was that she didn't tolerate abdominal touch, that her kids, you know how a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old and a five-year-old would run up to mom throw arms around mom's waist and, um, and give her a hug. Yeah, these kids can't do that. They can't touch mom's abdomen because of the pain. So she has a very tender um, abdominal tissues. However, she doesn't have any pain with bowel movements, urination, or intercourse. And you, those of you that see endometriosis and abdominal and pelvic pain patients, you always ask, do you have pain with bowel movements, urination, uh, digestion, or intercourse? That will give you a clue as to where your adhesions are. So this tells us that it could be worse. <clears throat> However, abdominal palpation with her, uh, she was plus four tender, which means you can barely touch her abdomen um, without having her sweat, and it's kind of connected to her upper lip, right? So make faces and flinch a bit. Abdomen was firm and she was, you were unable, we were unable to depress the abdominal surface um, at the skin, so you couldn't depress her abdomen at all. Um, we ran the concussion protocol um, by putting it in you know, a washcloth up just under her um, um, sternum and then put washcloths and uh, precision care on the left side of her abdomen and ran scarring and 77, 13 and 77, which is the frequency that dissolved the adhesions in the mice. 
65 the large bowel the the um the sigmoid was amazing like the sigmoid was glued to everything 129 is the sigmoid 37 is the bladder 34 is the uterus <clears throat> once the sigmoid was loose um she had pain lower down in the lower left side um where the sigmoid and the the uh, adh the rectum so began doing scarring in the rectum scarring and and you could feel the taut band between the rectum and the sigmoid and the ovary and the tube so seven is the ovary four is the tube and when you looked at it it's like her pubic bone was not moving when her abdomen was palpated so we did scarring in the connective tissue 13 and 77 13 and 142 with palpation of the ischial tuberosities um, so the issue of tuberosities are sort of at the pelvic floor, and the pubic bone is kind of anterior to that. And basically, while I was running connective tissue and fascia, um, I reached my hand kind of up the top of her thigh into the pelvic floor near the ischial tuberosities across the pelvic floor, up around her pubic bone. She had her jeans on. Um, and she was draped, so we just kind of loosened her zipper and unbuttoned her and mobilized the pelvic floor and the pubic bone while we're running frequencies for scarring. What was interesting was, as we did that, she could feel changes in her head and tingling in her feet as the pelvis moved. So what is the only thing that connects your head and your pelvis and your feet? It's the dura, right? If you if you move somebody's pelvis, the dura connects with the sacrum and the tailbone, right? And you move the pelvis, and somebody says, oh, I can feel that in between my eyebrows and at the base of my skull. There's only one tissue that goes from the base of your skull to your tailbone. That's the dura. So we switched to scarring in the dura, 13 and 443, and did this pelvic mobilization and um, she's laying on her back to get treated, and I brought her hip up <clears throat> while we ran scarring in the dura and flexed her hips and then um, brought one knee up and rotated her trunk to release the adhesions in the dura. She's 38, and she hasn't moved her pelvis for 20 years. So the dura has gotten used to just not moving. Does that make sense? So when we did hip flexion trunk rotation using the knees as a lever it was sort of magic it's like the whole pelvis freed up and her headache went away and her head tipped back and everything got easier so that was something I would not have predicted and honestly I've never done before in a pelvic pain patient wouldn't have thought of it but the patient said she could feel changes in her head and tingling in her feet as the pelvis moved that's what told me to use the dura. Okay, the frequencies are using figuring out the connection to the patient's symptoms and reports. The other piece of it. So the right side of the abdomen was next because uh, what we did on the left didn't do much uh, to the right side. So we did roughly the same things: scarring in the connective tissue, the um, cecum, the ascending colon, and the small bowel. Then sclerosis in the adipose. This lady was not the one that had the omentum surgery. This one is just endometriosis, and there's blood clots and endometrium and adhesions and inflammation everywhere. Okay, that includes the omentum, 397, scarring the ovary, scarring in the tube, scarring in the uterus, 34, and the bladder. Inferior pelvis near the pubic bone, we ran scarring and the vagina absolutely no change so we know that isn't involved <clears throat> we did scarring in the uterus scarring in the bladder with movement inferior to superior in the pelvis with my hand down in her crotch basically tipping her pelvis and moving the um, pelvic floor soft tissue and that freed that up um, then as you palpated her abdomen 13 and uh, the upper abdomen was tight so we did scarring in the transverse colon, 27 and 16, and that softened the whole upper part. 13 and 155 is the frequency. 155 is the endometrium. 
And I thought, well, that's a dandy idea. She's got endometrial tissue all over her abdomen. Didn't do a thing. Scarring the endometrium, nothing. 284 is the frequency for blood clots, right? So 284 and 62, it's also the frequency for chronic inflammation. 62, the blood supply, 155, the endometrium. That took away the pain in her abdomen. That was extraordinary. Now her abdomen was soft and non-tender, and it was totally cool. Um, I didn't use 40 much, just 284. Now at the end, any time you do this much work on somebody's belly, um, you run 18 and 62. And so 18 and 62 is to stop bleeding. That ran three, maybe four minutes. And her belly got soft. She got totally stoned. It was hilarious. Um, she was pain-free at rest, pain-free with palpation. Her abdomen was soft and non-tender. Her posture was more upright. Her movement was free. However, when you change somebody's posture that much after 20 years, they don't know how to walk. So we did gait training with her, did the toe heel walking to get her brain introduced to how her um, body was now. Um, I used uh, an adjusting device that chiropractors can get, um, maybe naturopaths too, uh, called an activator. I used the mechanical one, uh, activator two. Uh, at the pubic bone, the SI joints, once she started walking normally, uh, her thoracics don't move, her ribs don't move, um, her chest has to move. Everything has to move differently now that she's not constricted at the abdomen. And while she's walking, then so we got this adjusted and mobilized. While she's walking, we did the frequencies to increase secretions in the cerebellum, 81 and 84. We basically, um, Paris walked back and forth with her with a, a precision care running 81 and 84 while she walked. And her gait and her body movement completely changed. It was mind-boggling. It was great. 81 and 92 was the, um, was the next thing, sort of to get her brain connected to her sensory cortex um, or sensory cortex connected to her body. Um, because while she was moving more normally, she actually... I think she said, I don't know where my body is. I mean, I can move it, but it feels weird. So once we ran 81 and 92, increased secretions in the sensory cortex, that took care of that. So um, this was just like awesome. It was so fun. And it was a one visit fix. Um, heard from the patient a week later. She is still pain free, still doing well. Oh. And her kids can hug her. That is why we do what we do. Okay, next case. This was a student. Remember the beginning of the course seminar when everybody in the group holds hands? We had about 24, 25 students at um, Cleveland Clinic in January. And um, one of the, the first frequency I run is 970 and 200, just to reduce emotional tension for anybody that's a little bit uptight in the group about, you know, what's coming and the unknown and, you know, travel and being someplace new and all that. So 970 and 200 usually makes people feel a little more relaxed. This student became lightheaded and kind of dwarfed, but not pleasant. It was distressing. Um, she didn't like it. And that's unusual. So that made me pay attention. So 970 and 200 is uh, emotional tension. So I thought, well, maybe 200 is a solar plexus. Maybe we need to run 94 and 200. Same reaction, plus she described a full feeling in her head. It was neither comfortable nor pleasant. It was a pressure feeling. So 94 and 200 had this same lightheaded, I don't like this kind of thing. The response to the frequencies tells you something. That's the take home message with this slide. The response to the frequencies tells you something. So what is 200? 200 is the solar plexus. Solar plexus is an energy center. Okay, you're at 94 and 200, 970 and 200 for these energy center at the solar plexus and um, she doesn't like it. And her head feels full, feels full energy centers. There's an energy center in the head. 
that we have a frequency for, right? 102 is the energy center for the crown center at the top of the head. So instant hypothesis, the frequency response tells you something that helps guide you in your choice of the next frequencies to run. Energy centers at the top of the head. That's 102. Hypothesis. What if activation of the solar plexus created a flow of energy in the energy system and the chakras or energy centers, created a flow that was blocked by an imbalance or a blockage at the crown center, 102, is the energy center at the top of the head. <clears throat> that was my hypothesis. So I ran. What? We have a frequency for that, right? 35 and 102. 35 is to balance an energy center. 102 is the energy center at the top of the head. So the fullness in her head went down instantly, and the pressure was relieved, and we ran that until she felt normal. She was still a little dwarfed, not used to being dwarfed. We get kind of used to that, but new people aren't. So I ran 6.8 and 38. And that is for constitutional factors, but it also tends to make people feel more grounded. So here's a question that came next. Why was the solar plexus so reactive? Why would the solar plexus running 94 and 200 and 970 and 200, why would that be unpleasant? Why would it create such a strong reaction? New hypothesis. What if the solar plexus is unbalanced as an energy center? I don't know if it's blocked or hyper or blocked makes sense, but why? How do you balance it? Well, we have a frequency for that. 35 is the frequency to balance an energy center. 200 is the frequency for the solar plexus. When we ran 35 and 200, it felt good. The norm she normalized sensations. Fullness went away, the, the unpleasant, distressed feeling went away, it was done. And then uh, we ran 970 and 33. Now we were doing this on the whole group, and some people liked 35 and 200s, but it was this particular student that was um, the reason for the treatment. 970 and 33, restoring joy. So it was just interesting. In 20 some odd years, 22 years of doing this, I've never had anybody react that way to 94 and 200, 970 and 200. The take home message with this slide, with this case, is the response to the frequencies tells you something. Okay? Your challenge is to think through what the implications are of the patient's response to the frequencies. What does it tell you? What is your hypothesis after that? So to go from the solar plexus to the crown back to the solar plexus, it meant that she left feeling good and the energy centers were theoretically in better shape. I can't see energy centers, more is the pity. Um, but uh, ultimately, if you hadn't, if I hadn't treated this, she would have gone back to baseline the next day. She would have, you know, run the, yeah, she would have been still blocked, but more comfortable the next day. It sort of wears off. <clears throat> but the take home message here is that the frequency response tells you something. You can develop a hypothesis 35 and 102, 35 and 200. I have to say, in 22 years of doing this, I've never run 35 and 200 before, but it made sense, right? Balance the solar plexus would fix why it was she had that reaction to 94 and 200 and 970 and 200. That was really interesting. Uh, okay, this next patient was extraordinary. Um, it was a patient of one of the uh, clinicians at Cleveland Clinic. It's a 68 year old male with a history of tonsillar cancer. 11 years pre previously. Um, as the patient was describing his medical history, so we take a history before we treat, even when we treat in the evening. So this is now 7, 
um, on Saturday, I think, um, as he was describing his medical history, so tonsillar cancer, radiation, whatever, he said, I was a paramedic and a fireman. And as he said that, he became so overcome with emotion that he couldn't speak or finish the phrase for up to three or four minutes. He choked back tears, couldn't talk, didn't actually weep, so tears didn't come fully to his face, but he was so distressed that he couldn't talk. So before examining or treating his neck, he was treated with the concussion protocol and relax and balance. So um, Margaret Taylor was in the back of the room and um, we asked, I asked her to uh, treat his neck, uh, sorry, before we treated his neck, to treat the concussion protocol and emotional relax and balance. Anytime somebody with a history of cancer has been treated with radiation therapy in the head and neck, you can assume that concussion and relax and balance is something that should you should run, right? That's a that's a given. So Margaret ran that so that he was prepped by the time we got back to treat him at the end of the at the end of the class in the evening. He brought a cooler that had his um, crushed ice in it. Um, we'll describe that. So visual inspection showed that the skin on his neck uh, was darkened and scarred. Um, his ne there's a, a feature of patients who've had head and neck radiation um, where the, the neck is described, it's called woody neck or wood, yeah, woody neck. Um, the underlying fascia and the muscles are hard in a, um, in a war? in a manner characteristic of radiation damage. I have no idea what that typo is. It's a characteristic of radiation damage connective tissue. In a what? A way. Oh, in a way. There we go. In a way that's characteristic of radiation damage connective tissue. It's called woody neck. He has difficulty swallowing, and I assumed incorrectly that the obstruction was in his esophagus. Um, in point of fact, it was above the epiglottis, um, and if he obstructs, he said he can, so if he swallows something and gets stuck, he can cough it up without choking. So that suggested, once I finally paid attention, that it wasn't his esophagus, it was his pharynx that was scarred. Um, he had tonsillar cancer, not um, uh, cancer in the back of the neck or the throat, so it was a little bit higher. And if you look at the collimation for the radiation that they did, it's going to be up higher, so it's not in the esophagus. It's the only radiation damage to the neck that I've treated that was in the pharynx, not the esophagus. So, but his diet is limited to soft food and small bites, and he has difficulty swallowing. He does not however, require a port or a feeding assistance device. Some of these patients can't swallow, uh, even saliva, the ones I've treated. And um, so they insert a port into his stomach and, um, and have a way of, of getting him nutrition that doesn't involve the, um, uh, doesn't involve swallowing. It's, yeah radiation treatment to the head and neck is problematic. So patient is very garrulous. He's friendly and talkative and he loves telling paramedic stories. So we began treating the scar tissue with the usual protocol for radiation and do scar tissue in the head and neck, right? So 54 and 10, radiation is the gift that keeps on giving. So 54 and 10, 54 is radiation, 10 is radiation. Blood supply, 62, 26 is the esophics, 24 is the larynx, 43 is the pharynx. As he's chatting with us and telling his stories, if you've known firemen, you know that they're most like this. Um, as he told stories, he would choke up and be unable to talk. He would just get choked up with emotion. He was clearly distressed. It was clear that he had PTSD from his paramedic experiences. Some of the stories were particularly gruesome. Um, there were, ugh, there's one that still, I can see the visual image that he had in his head, patient that was run over by like a street uh, steamroller, and you don't want to know. It was gross. Anyway, 
So as he talked, he'd choke up and be unable to talk. Each time he choked up and wept a bit, I switched to 40 and 89. So the hypothesis was that this reaction of, of choking up was caused by the emotional link between the amygdala, where the emotions and stress and trauma were stored, and the memories, the visual memories and experiences that are stored in the hippocampus. The amygdala and the hippocampus are linked because that's how you keep from doing the same thing again. When you have a memory that is particularly stressful, the emotional response is connected to that memory in the hippocampus, and your nervous system doesn't want you to do that again. The key to this was that his descriptions were visually incredibly vivid and detailed and very emotionally charged. So as he told his stories, and in, what, 60 minutes of treatment, there must have been 10 different stories, delivering babies, picking up dead bodies, pieces of bodies you don't want to know. Anyway, so as he's talking and telling these stories, I switched to 40 and 89. And that quieted the emotional response and shortened the time during which he was overcome by emotion. Every time. First time is three to four minutes. After I ran 40 and 89, it went down to one to two minutes. Then it went down to a minute and a half. Then it was down to the point where he could talk and only be choked up for about 30 seconds. He could continue to talk. And we got that reaction down. So the practitioner that was going to treat him was instructed to run the PTSD protocol on him. So the neck radiation scarring was fairly straightforward. He brought in two cups of crushed ice and a plastic spoon. And the crushed ice was perfect. So we ran 13 and 26 as he swallowed it. And it had the usual effect of making the swallowing easier. This is after you treat 54 and 10 and 40. So the ice chips, we use crushed ice because it forms a semi-solid bolus that stretches the esophagus and the pharynx without risking choking. He got stuck a couple of times. The bolus got stuck a couple of times, but it melts. So it's a little bit of a, of a esophagus freeze, but it's not going to choke him. And one time it got stuck in the pharynx, and he was able to cough up a few chips, and he was good. The obstruction was still present, however, and the bolus of ice would get stuck above the epiglottis. That's what he told me. It's stuck above the windpipe. So it eventually occurred to me, I was a little slow, that the scarring was not in the esophagus, but in the pharynx. However, it was not as high as the larynx. The pharynx caused his arm to soften up. <clears throat> uh, so that worked. And then he mentioned that his voice had become permanently changed. Um, so we ran uh, 54 and 10, and 40, I left that out. Anytime you run 54 and 10, you also run 40, because radiation creates ongoing inflammation, and it's the inflammation that causes scar tissue. So 54, 10, and sorry, there's a little typo there, should be 40, and then 13 scarring. 55 from the advance is the frequency for the vocal cords. So as we treated 55, I didn't tell him I was treating the vocal cords, right? You know how I am about blinding the patient to the effect of the frequencies to minimize placebo effect. So he treated 55, his vocal cords, and his voice became lighter and higher in pitch and less gravelly and less distorted. Each time he swallowed ice chips with 13 and 43, uh, the pharynx running, Swallowing became easier, and eventually, after five to six spoonfuls, he no longer had the obstruction. By the end of the hour, his stories became less gruesome. He told ones that were funny, and his moments of incapacitating emotion became shorter until he would choke up for only about 20 to 30 seconds. The treatment plan with his practitioner included running the PTSD protocol and a second session with swallowing ice chips while running 13 with the esophagus and the pharynx. Um, I would also run radiation and inflammation again just on spec. So I think we have, it doesn't tell me how We're many five, slides. Five minutes. Yeah, yeah, we got six minutes left. Okay. Um, well, maybe eight. Um, so I just want to see how many slides. Yeah, okay, so this is the last case. 
So this was a patient that had an auto accident in 2010 and another accident in 2016. She had recent neck pain and disc symptoms in the neck and shoulder. That was interesting. So, you know, it's like the standard upper cervical muscle thing uh, protocol. 40 and 94, well, 94 is the medulla that quiets down the accessory nerve and relaxes the upper trap. 40 and 10 relax the neck and the suboccipitals were still tight. 124 and 100 soften the suboccipitals, but the patient became nauseous and hot. So nauseous and hot is a vagal response, right? It's like, okay, this is not good. Ran 40 and 94, quieted down the nausea. Suboccipitals were still tight. So this was actually a practitioner who was in the class. Um, once I quieted down the nausea, uh, we did have the concussion protocol uh, running on her at the same time. Quieted down the nausea, but the suboccipitals were till, still wicked. One to, I snuck back to 124 and 100. Once again, not telling the practitioner, what I'm, the patient, what I'm running, got the same response. Nauseous and hot, very vagal. Uh, 40 and 94, quieted the nausea, suboccipitals were still rigid. 94 and 94, quieted the visceral reaction, trauma in the medulla, relaxed the neck, went back to 124 and 100. The patient got not only nauseous and hot, but got extremely agitated and started crying. She was just panicked. There's no other way to describe it. It was at the same time vagal and extremely sympathetic response. She was I mean, laying on her back on the table with a washcloth behind her neck and washcloth on her chest. And she was in full fight or flight mode and nauseous and hot at the same time. I don't understand that mechanism. I ran 40 and 562. If somebody gets that agitated, you can take down their, their sympathetic nervous system in about 60 seconds. So we ran 40 and 562, stopped the crying, stopped the agitation, got rid of the nausea, and the hot flashing was gone. I don't totally understand how the sympathetics did all of that, but that was the response. 40 and 562 began to soften the neck muscles and the suboccipital muscles. It ran for two to three minutes. As she's talking, Oh, okay, new piece of history. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Because I think I asked her, have you had any head injuries? And she said, oh, yeah, I was dropped when I was a child, like uh, I think she was two or three, on her face, right? Like dropped from somebody carrying her to on her face on the floor, whipped her head into extension. What if this visceral reaction, so here's the hypothesis, right? The symptoms and the reaction to the frequencies gives you a hypothesis. What if the visceral reaction to repairing C1 ligaments, right? Because that's what 124 and 100 is going to do is repair the ALAR and the transverse ligaments. What if that visceral reaction happens because the medulla finds any change at C1 life-threatening? Because that's how it acts. Oh, my God, don't treat those ligaments because I'm going to die. That was what hot and flushing and agitated and crying looks like. What if C1 is approximating the medulla due to that early neck trauma? That's the hypothesis. Okay, what if this whole thing has to do with where C1 is? And if we move C1, if C1 is approximating, is up against the medulla, and we go to rearrange those ligaments, what's going to happen? Did trauma, 294. And if you remember from the advance, 284 is, this, is the frequency for the C1 vertebral segment. The team at Cleveland Clinic is using these vertebral segment frequencies. So T84 is C1, 283 is C2, 282 is C3, and on down the spine. So we did trauma to the C1 segment. That started relaxing things. Um, subluxation, 39. I have no idea what that is. I'm a terrible chiropractor. I don't know what a subluxation is, but there's a frequency for it. And that helped settle things down and soften her neck's muscles. And then vitality in C1, that's what we ran. And it was productive. 
neck muscles relaxed, she felt good, headache was gone, she was not panicked, it was, it was all good. So her treatment plan based on her response to these frequencies was, I want to find out what's going on C1, right? Anybody else? Imaging, cervical spine x-rays, flexion extension x-rays, APOM and APOM side bending. In a perfect world, if imaging is free, I would do um, a thin slice MRI from just above the occiput down to about C3. So you can do an MRI of the neck. She doesn't have enough symptoms in the periphery to justify uh, an MRI of the neck medically, but if she has a checkbook and she wins the lottery or she, you know, gets an inheritance or something and she's got the imaging or she's got the finances to pay for a, um, an upper cervical MRI, it'd be a good thing. That's a, that's a thing. What's it look like? So with a thin slice, uh, you can get two millimeters, sometimes one millimeter, but two millimeter slices with the higher definition um, MRIs. And you can do a thin slice from above. I want to find out what's going on in her medulla, what's going on in her brainstem. That response is visceral. It's, it's vagal. It's all of that came out of the medulla. So what's it look like? So thin slice from just above the occiput down to about C3 and see if you can image any tears in the ligaments or inflammation in the C1 versa. Um, continue with FSM treatments after the x-rays. You might want to do 13 and 443 maybe to release the dura. Torn and broken in C1. You already know that C1 is an issue. Um, do the concussion protocol and see if there is some way for the patient to tolerate 124 and 100 or see if you can make sense of why it isn't tolerated. What's going on up there? Rehabbing her upper cervical spine. So this lady has constant neck pain, constant suboccipital headaches, constant upper neck pain and headaches and tightness. The only way to fix that is to fix what C1 is doing as it relates to the occiput and C2. Only way to fix that is to, or to be able to do that is find out if it's safe to treat C1, find out what's going on up there. So if she was my patient, there's no earthly way I would treat her again until she had had x-rays. So MRI is optional, but you need to find out what on earth is going on with those ALAR ligaments. So that's that. So that was life in January. February has been exciting. We had some interesting cases at uh, the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. I haven't written those up yet. Um, but it was really fun to get the rest of these cases completed. I love doing webinars, and I'm so glad Kevin got us started doing them. It's a good way to keep up with everybody, um, and it's a good way for you to check in. And, and, um, and the frequencies are easy. Learning how to think about what the – what they do and how the patient responds, that's the key to being able to use FSM with optimal outcomes and optimal responses. It's obvious that there's no earthly way I could have done any of this without a precision care or an old blue box or precision micro or something. So um, a lot of the treatments you can do with a custom care or an auto care, or, um, but for this kind of stuff, you need a precision care. It's, you have to be able to do a treatment, assess the response, make a hypothesis about what you should do next, and then use the frequencies to help you produce a positive outcome. I had a great time today. I'm so glad we're doing these. I'm glad you were here. Um, tell your friends. Tell the other practitioners. And if you haven't already signed up for the advanced in the symposium. This is our 20 year anniversary and this is, it's miraculous actually, what you have done, what we have done as a, as a group um, with FSM is extraordinary. So we have an instructor training on Wednesday. We have, uh, what's that, the 29th. We have the advanced on the 30th and 31st of March. We are at Green Valley Ranch Resort. So go to the website um, to see the pictures and to sign up. 
Um, and then the symposium is Saturday, Sunday. Usually the symposium is a day and a half. We have eight, 15, 18, 15 presenters at the symposium. Um, I'm not moderating it in it. Roger Billica is, so you'll actually have somebody that you know can tell jokes and is pretty funny. Um, Jim Oshman is going to be there with some magnificent new stuff with uh, the model for how FSM works. Diana Cross and is um, bringing her FSM model to um, the course. We have uh, case reports on tendinopathies and Hashimoto's and the case reports are coming in. It's really going to be fun. So I hope you're there. And um, we will see you next, well, actually, we're not going to do a webinar next month because we're going to be in Las Vegas for two weeks. So the next webinar will be in April, and I'll hopefully present some things that were presented at the symposium, and we'll see you then. Hmm? Oh, anybody have any questions? Yeah? Doing the, just click on the chat. Click on what chat? I don't have any of that. I can. Oh, Kevin's. if somebody has questions, you can type them in. Or you can email me. You know how to find me. You go to the website, and we have contact at Frequency Specific. We used to have info at Frequency Specific, but it got hacked. So that was kind of gross. But contact at Frequency Specific, and the team forwards it on. Um, thanks a bunch. And these, this webinar is going to be available on YouTube. Um, and Kevin will send everybody the link. I think he's going to send it to everybody, everybody. Thanks, and, Carol. Uh -huh. Thanks, Carol. See you in Las Vegas. Thanks, Carol. Oh, Marilyn Yay, Marilyn. Aunt Marilyn Miller is presenting a case report. It's really cool. Orthopedic cases and lymphedema, I think. Yay, Marilyn. Okay, guys, do good things. Save lives. Love what you do. I'll see you in April or in March. Bye. Pat Shea.